Welcome to Big Brother on the Couch. It's the show that peels back the layers of our housemates' minds as though they were giant onions and gives you the eye-watering results. So, it's been another week of emotional turmoil in the Big Brother house. We've had halfway housemates gain housemate status and then lose it again. We've had housemates lose housemate status and then regain it again, plus housemates who stayed housemates but thought they might not. All in all, some proper messing with minds, which is actually great for us because mind stuff is exactly what's on the menu tonight. <laughs> Amy, Jonty and Cara Louise have finally become bona fide housemates, but do they have a game plan? Their body language reveals all. I have more than one side to me, as you're probably aware. It's stressful being a housemate, and humour is a wonderful release. We investigate the psychology of being funny. Funny ha-ha, not funny weird. Horse walks in Rabat at the bar and says, why the long face? He says, I'm a horse. The housemates have been bonding for the past 10 weeks, so how will three newbies affect the group dynamics? Full-blown analysis coming up. I'm very curious to see what happens next. And for tonight's experiment, we asked the housemates to pretend to be other housemates, all in the name of science. The results of that science later. Hi, my name's Amy. I'm a grandmother. Did I not tell you I'm a grandmother? <laughs> <laughs> OK. Amy, Cara Louise and John T are the new kids on the block, but their initial arrival was not entirely well received. <laughs> I'm a glamour model. Right? Yeah. Oh, excellent. I don't know what to believe about her. For her to come in at a later stage and sort of hook on to him, I said to him, just be careful. That Amy lass knows she's cool, so she might be playing there. Yeah. I'm cool, I just need to be cool. Amy's, I think, has got another side to her. Hello. 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 This is Kiki. Hello. Kiki. Hello. He's an eccentric, actually. He's the great British very eccentric. Yeah. He yeah, he's very eccentric. You know what I think? He's, he's fake. fake. He's, he's fake. fake. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's a little bit weird, but, um, you know, that's cool. <laughs> How's it going? Oh, it's good. She lost me vote a little bit when she did this last. <laughs> I have to be myself and hope for the best. That's all I can do. I get good vibes about um, Kara. She's just, you know, she's all right. She's just nice. One word, and you know what it is. Sketchy. <laughs> I love that. She has coined so many phrases, hasn't she? Sketchy. OK, so here to give us his expert analysis on whether the new housemates have got a game plan and what it might be is psychologist Professor Geoffrey Beatty. Hi, Geoffrey. How Hi, are you yeah. doing? Good. So, I mean, undoubtedly, the new housemates, they've got, they've got an advantage, haven't they? Because, I mean, they must have been watching. You, you would know so much about them. You would know about their personalities, yeah. about how they interact, what they say in front of each other, what they say behind each other's backs. You would know that Liam's interest in motorbikes. You would, you would know yeah, which that, Amy used. Which Amy used. Friendly. You would know that Ziggy loves his dog Molly more than he loved Chanel. You would know <laughs> that, that Liam is... Gagging for a cuddle? Is, is, that, yes, is, is, a, that, is that a right expression? A cuddle. Yeah, gagging yeah, for a cuddle. Yeah, yeah. You, you would know all of that. You would also know which housemates are most popular on the outside. So if you wanted to be strategic and link up with, with important people in the house, you would know exactly who to go for. They say knowledge is power, and you can see how people could use power here very easily. So a game plan could easily be formulated before you went in. So we wanted to know if they had a game plan. We called them to the diary room so you could analyse their body language. And let's kick off with Amy. <laughs> Amy. Yeah. Did you have a game plan figured out before you entered the house? No, not at all. Um, no, my whole plan or thoughts on the house has just been have fun, um, I suppose. So what's she telling me? She's not really telling me anything there. She's what's she tell telling you? Because oh, oh, you can oh, oh, see oh, things she's, that she's I can't see. She's telling me an awful lot, actually. <laughs> I think there are three things there which are telling me something really significant. The first is her kind of exaggerated, hyper-ritualised expression when she answers the question. What she's doing is she's taking the kind of spontaneous look of disgust and exaggerating it consciously. And we do that when we're really trying to cover... Really turning If you said to me, Davina, you know, Geoffrey, do you find me attractive? And I didn't want you to kind of work out if I did. I might exaggerate a response. I'd say, no, Davina. It'd be like this exaggerated response. 
You'll have to work it out. OK. So, so, so there's that, first of all. It's kind of exaggerated. So I'm thinking, why is she doing that? Then the second thing is that once that exaggerated expression fades, you see something quite different. The micro-expression is one of kind of shock and kind of horror that... Why are they quizzing me about this? What are they trying to find out? What might I reveal here? Actually? And she's trying to think about what can I say that people what, might like about exactly, me. Exactly, exactly. So she's not giving a natural response. She's not giving a natural response. And the third thing is when she says she's just in the house to have fun, she does this kind of tongue poke, which is this kind of... Ah, uh, the tongue poke. The tongue poke, listen, it's every week now. It's the unconscious rejection of what she's saying. So I think there are three things here which make me think she's playing some kind of strategic game. Yeah, definitely. OK, then Big Brother asked her another question. Let's have a look. <laughs> Have you been your true self so far? Um, I think so. Um, I've quit, I've asked myself that a couple of times because um, I hate to think that I wasn't being. Um, and I'm, I think I'm always quite open about stuff. Um, I tend to sort of say what I what I think and feel. Um, and I think I've been myself. <laughs> It's, you know, when we know what we're looking for, yes, it's quite yeah. uncomfortable, isn't it? it because it is she's a bit not uncomfortable. No, yeah. straight down the line at no. all there, is she? Because it's a pretty straightforward question and it's a pretty straightforward answer and it's not cognitively difficult. But during that answer, she makes 11 fill pauses in 65 seconds, an incredibly high rate. And fill pauses are a measure of the anxiety underpinning speech. So what this is saying is she's having real difficulty in articulating her answer. There's anxiety just below there. So again, it's, there's all this strategic thinking going on just beneath the surface. Let's have a look at that. Um, 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 um. It's and, agony, uh, isn't it? And there is also two lip licks, again, a sign of anxiety, a sign of negative emotion. So it's, it's a straightforward question. Is she showing her true self? Two here lip are the licks. lip licks. Yeah, yeah. Lots of negative emotion just kept in here. OK, so um, how is she going to put her game plan into action in the house? Well, I think she had a very simple game plan. She used her knowledge about Liam gagging for a cuddle. She targeted him specifically. But do you think she fancies him a bit? I think she fancies him a bit, but I think the signals she sends are more than so. just generalised flirting. Every time Liam talked to her in the garden, she sent out this very conscious hair flicking so hair flicking is, I fancy you? It, well, it's, no, it's an approach signal, and she made sure that Liam got the signal. What do you mean? Signal. Is that like saying, come to me, I come fancy Come to me, and it was targeted directly Liam's yes. way. Yes. Targeted directly Liam's way. And, and, of course, he got the message. So and I look, think... There's a lot of it yeah, going on. Yeah, a lot of it going on. Is that on. for me? Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> Jeffrey, I'm feeling the heat. I'm feeling the heat. Stop! Uh, <gasps> so are they going to become an item? Because you are now my relationships expert, and I, you've proved to me that I know nothing when it comes to relationships in that house. So... <laughs> What's going to happen? Uh, they're not going to become an item because I think that Liam already kind of rejected her on the way in. It wasn't to kind of spur her blushes or anything. Liam is a bit of a strategic thinker himself. He doesn't... We know in the past he rejected Nikki. He, I think he may keep his distance from... Uh, and is that Amy. because she doesn't think he doesn't think she's going to be popular in the house? I mean, the other he, housemates haven't bonded. They her. haven't bonded her with her, and I, I don't think Liam wants to be too attached to anyone he thinks might, might might be a kind of weakness on his part. Yeah. Well, let's have a look at John T. Um, here's what he said when Big Brother asked him. John T, did you have a game plan figured out before you entered the house? Not really. No, I thought I'd be here for a week, have a real laugh, drive everybody completely mad, get booted out, and go out laughing, and uh, it's turned into something a bit different from, from that, in a way. Well, th th there's an element of that, but um, it's, uh, I don't know, I, th I think part of me's ended up taking a little bit more seriously than perhaps I thought I was going to. Now, I don't, I don't know much about the body language side of that, but verbally, I felt like he was telling me the truth, was he? He was, and the body language completely backs it up. The first thing he does when he hears what the question is, he goes into this... Ah! You've seen that we before. We know that. The lawyer Harry pose. Harry has talked about that. The lawyer pose. Now, confidence. it's associated with dominance, ah, dominance. and confidence, but mm. it's also a sign, of course, of relaxation. And the reason we associate it with dominance is high dominant people can show relaxation in our presence. Subordinates have to be kind of more kind of on guard in their uh, presence. So I think that's the first thing we're looking at for here. And the second thing is, when he's saying, I don't know, he makes this wonderful metaphoric gesture when he's doing it. And what the metaphoric gesture is doing, it's reflecting in his mind that he really genuinely doesn't know. Now, in some senses, the content isn't so important, but what's really important here is that he is under no unconscious obligation to inhibit that movement in any way. So it just shows that he's being open, 
relaxed and expressive. In other words, nothing to hide. So when he's got the gestures, yeah. along with the verbal, what he's saying, we know that he's telling the truth because... We know that he's telling the truth up. because, generally speaking, when people lie, they try to inhibit it. Right. OK, next up, we've got Cara Louise. Let's have a look. Did you have a game plan figured out before you entered the house? <laughs> Uh, well, if I did, I really wish someone would tell me what it was, because I seem to have forgotten. Uh, <laughs> no, I definitely had absolutely no game plan. That whole, the whole idea that I did is I find absolutely hilarious. So just quickly, she's referring to Amy there, isn't she? Insinuating exactly. that Cara Louise had a game plan. Exactly. It's wonderful what? seeing the stages of her non-verbal behaviour until she gets the laugh in place. The laugh is the biggest mask that human beings kind of use in everyday life, laughing and smiling. Look there. Yeah, What's but you that? see, but the mask isn't really covering the whole thing up. <laughs> I th this is just at the start <laughs> of the whole thing. Ha, ha, ha. And then, like, right. and then the, the kind of micro expression is one of absolute sadness. So it's not guilt, it's sadness. So I think she's sad that she, in some sense she's being accused of having a game plan. And I think her game plan was pretty vague to begin with. If, if, if you could call it a game plan, which was get on with the girly girls, it was as vague as that. But actually, I think as a girl, good idea to get on with the girls. I think it is, actually. Stay in with the sisters, because we're the ones that can be really nasty if you get on the wrong side. And, and men are just too risky. Too yeah. risky in the big brother yeah, house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the girls don't like it. And the girls Thank don't like so it. Thank you so much, Geoffrey! <laughs> There's still to come how your sense of humour is actually a genuine, bona fide, it's official window into your mind. See you in a bit. On the couch, it's a show all about mind stuff. And the next subject up for discussion is how laughter reveals so very, very much more about your personality than you would ever imagine. And I'm not joking. Two more fuchs for 40 minutes. <laughs> horse walks in Rabar the Bond says, Why the long face? He says, I'm a horse. <laughs> Can you eat it to go to me, Hughes, if you be? <laughs> Big Brother's making us out for a bunch of yoghurt tops. <laughs> Spanking. Yeah, that's very nice. Tracy! Tracy. <laughs> Johnson's farting Big as a man. Big Brother I'd be pissed off in a club if I got that. Oh, she's putting her foot over her head. <laughs> I just want to have sex with her. I'm free! <laughs> Two women walk into a house. You think one of them would have seen it? <laughs> <laughs> that is one that you kind of stop and you think about it for a couple of seconds and then you go, <laughs> I thought that was right. Anyway, here to tell us about the psychology of humour, uh, you know, how we use it, what it says about us, is psychologist Dr. Tomas Jamado from Music. Hi, Thomas, how are you? I'm good, Davina. So, it would help if I had my cards around the right way around. Right. Um, what is the psychological significance of humour? Traditionally, humour has been associated with health, and that's both physical and psychological health. And that's even before psychology was invented, in a sense. The ancient Greeks, and even in the Bible, there's references to a happy heart being the best form of medicine. Mm. So, when psychologists revisited this area of research in the past 20 years, they also started to look at its impact in health and they found that humor is associated with a better immune system it affects T cells that can help people combat stress and a number of things so I mean it's not totally counterintuitive but there is research evidence for this and what um, is humor in psychological terms in psychological terms it's a very broad concept it's associated with um, a amusing or funny event but also with people so there's individual differences in sense of humor as we all know some people are funnier than others but um, very interestingly people use humor in different ways and there's different humor styles um, which in the past 10 years have been associated not always with positive outcomes, but also sometimes with negative so outcomes. So sometimes humour can be used ba badly? It can be badly and it can have negative effects on you. So it depends on the different styles that we're looking at. Well, let's talk about the styles then. What kind of styles are there? The four humour styles are affiliative, self-enhancing, aggressive and self-defeating. And this is after a Canadian psychologist called Rod Martin, who is a worldwide expert in humour. 
Um, OK, so let's talk about affiliative humour. What is it? Affiliative humour is a stereotypical form of humour. So when we think of someone who is funny or something that is funny, you know, it's, it's all about engaging, is to use humour to um, create or enhance interpersonal links so um, to increase people's positive effect and it's characteristic of people who are just happy so they're stable extroverted and quite agreeable individuals uh, let's have a look at some examples from the house yeah it's the like, tunage yeah. yeah the music <gasps> tracy so, so Liam, you know, having a bit of a laugh with Tracy, that's quite good fun, isn't it? Joining everybody in. Yes, we've seen Liam and Brian. I mean, in both cases, you know, it's all about bringing people on, engaging. I mean, it looks quite... That was quite... definitely engaging, having your pants yeah, taken off. It, I mean, it, Brian definitely. wasn't being funny in there. The girls one... were. Yeah, they were, but it, he he shows that he has very good sense of humour because he's participating. I would too if I had a body like that. If you know what I mean. Uh, yes. So you know, but still, some people might not like it, and the difference is, you know, how you react to right. other people's joke. And he took it really well. And exactly, he because it's about you know um, enhancing group cohesiveness. I mean, it was a difficult week, as you said, and here they're all together having a bit of a laugh. So that's a typical example of affiliative humour. And here, Liam also engaging the group. So let's talk about self-enhancing humour. Self-enhancing humour, it's also associated with positive outcomes, but um, here, instead of the goal being enhancing interpersonal contact, instead of pleasing others, it's all about enhancing sort of the self. So it's an intra-psychical form of humour rather than Intersive. And sounds what this means is, it sounds complicated, but it's very simple because traditionally the psychoanalytical definition of humor was of humor as a defense or coping mechanism. Oh, okay. So it's to have so the to ability, exactly, in difficult times to see the funny side of life and then, you know, feel better about things. Let's see some examples. <laughs> Brian's cross. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be pissed off in a club if I got that. Yeah. <laughs> this last week, quite like four times. It's true. No more, mate. No more. It's true, though. It's so like embarrassing. Oh, yeah. I'm joking, man. <laughs> it's, no, it's thinking about it. I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to get out of it. I'm going to go around my mate's ass. And and my, mate's, yeah, yeah. my mate's dad's going to go to me, Brian. Yeah, exactly. Seriously. Yeah. Like, what was that in there? Hold something back. I can never claim anyone ever again. Yeah. Never. <laughs> At the same time. I'm free! Oh my god! <laughs> no wonder you will come out of his box! Well, we saw Ziggy a couple of times there. And Ziggy, Ziggy a couple of times because, I mean, Ziggy is quite neurotic and he's quite clever as well. We know this from the psychometric tests that they did when they entered the house. And actually, self enhancing humor is characteristic of people who are a little bit insecure and neurotic and who worry. And I mean, quite rightly so, because he's using this as a coping mechanism. So in the first case, he says, I'd be pissed off if I got that in a club, you know, meaning it could be worse. He could be in a club and he could have actually paid for that. It's not a very nice comment towards Shanessa, no. but the idea is to see the funny side of things. And the when they're side. discussing in the pool with Brian, you know, remember I cried, it has been... It's the ability to have the ability to look back at difficult times and say, actually, you know, it's, it's a bit of a laugh. It's not as serious as it, as it used to look back then. It's a very useful strategy to see the, the bright side of the present, basically, and look towards a brighter future. Well, let's look at a, uh, it sounds odd to me, aggressive humour. Let's, let's uh, have a look. Well, you talk me through it first. Sorry. Well, yeah, aggressive humour, it's very interesting because it's about enhancing the self but at the expense of others. So it's taking the mickey basically out basically, of people. Basically, yes, or... and it can be worse than that. The, the, in essence, this form of humour, this humour style is about bringing other people down in order to feel better yourself. Um, so it can impact badly not just in others, but also in yourself you. if, yeah. if it fails. Let's have a look. And then what happens if I'm just like, no, see, you know, I'm yeah. not interested, sorry, your chin's a little bit spotty. Yeah. And then, uh, you might, uh, no, I don't, I don't mean to say these things. Tell me one thing you wouldn't do. Huh? Piss on Amy if she's on fire. No. <laughs> Cara, she lost me vote a little bit when she did this laugh. She stood up next to us and went, <laughs> mm. And she fell into the sketchy box, like, I was <laughs> like, how did that happen? <laughs> I don't like that. 
Well, it's not very nice. It it's not very nice. Very it's nice. quite cruel. Right. I mean, uh, you know, we've seen first Liam, who we had seen in affiliate, using affiliate sense of humor, but here also being aggressive. And this clip is very interesting because... Yeah, well, two minutes later, he's kissing her. Exactly. But what is the point of his comment about, um, you know, Amy's potty chin? First Tell of all, me. First of all, he's trying to seek... Siggy's approval, who's saying, don't, don't, you know, get involved with her, I can tell yes. you from my own experience. And he's saying, well, actually, I don't really like her. So he finds something negative about her to say, so that, you know, Siggy knows he's not really interested in anything else but mm. sex. And then, uh, in, in safe, exactly. And then also, more interestingly, perhaps, he's, he's perhaps trying to find a negative thing in Amy in case it doesn't work. <gasps> so then, you know, if it, it'd if be like, it, well, I wasn't interested anyway. So exactly. So it's a win-win. Awful. It's a win-win situation. And then obviously Tracy in the garden. That's Tracy really in the not garden. Nice I mean, not a very don't nice. Don't repeat it. Yeah, I don't think we should repeat it. I mean, it's a very um, you know aggressive comment. But what is the point here? Also, you know, it, it's it's bringing other people down, a new housemate down, to sort of feel superior or um, basically to reassure herself that she has a higher and to status. Be in as well. To be you? in and feel that she really belongs to the real house. Um, okay, let's talk about self-defeating humor. Self-defeating humor is the opposite um, from aggressive because here what you're doing is to bring yourself down to make others feel better. That's a nice thing to do, isn't it's it? It's a very altruistic form of humor and it's characteristic in agreeable individuals who also tend to be a little bit insecure in some cases. Now, it can be successful in some circumstances in others not. So we'll have a look at two different examples. Oh, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I look like I've been attacked by a lawnmower right now. I am just look so stupid right now. I look like a yoghurt. I look like a yoghurt top right now. I look like a genuine yoghurt top right now. Who are you taking into the main house with you? Um, there's Kiki. Hello, eat like to go into the main house if you be. And bunny form. Oh, hello, yes, I'd, I'd be quite interested in going if I might. Thank you very much. And monkety tunkety. Oh, I'd absolutely hate to go, but he's going to make me go anyway, this big fat idiot here. Wound. You see, that's not really funny. I mean, Some he's people, trying to be funny. Uh, it's a bit odd. In both, in both cases, though, the characteristics is, you know, that they are basically is self-defeating because yes. they are bringing themselves down. Brian, clearly frustrated with the situation, I mean, he confronts Big Brother on several occasions. He is saying, I am a yogurt top. I mean, what else do you want to make of me? I mean, how much worse can this get? He, he does this all the time. He does Brian, this all the time. He? This is his type of humor. It's his type of humor, but in a sense, he's sacrificing himself and his image to entertain the audience and other housemates. He does it with other housemates as well. So it's, a, it's, a, it's quite an effective form of self-defeating. It's self working for Brian. It's working for Brian. Now, for John T, and I know some people were laughing when we showed the clip, it's a, it's a well, it's but a more. kind of laughing at him, really. Well, but that's maybe because he's putting himself down. I exactly, know. that's the effect. When self-defeating humor is successful, it encourages people to laugh at you. Now, it's very interesting that his own monkey, monkey the tankity or whatever he's called, <laughs> insults him. So he's using one of his puppets to insult, to insult himself. himself. Uh, we can't find a better example, Davina, of self-defeating humor. Whether it's funny or not. You know, let people he must decide. be fascinating for you psychologists. I think we need quite a few psychologists to analyse the richness of yeah. this kind of uh, humour. Uh, but yeah, it, it's quite funny, or in a funny, peculiar maybe way. Thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you. So to come tonight's experiment where the housemates switched identities for a bit. See you in a sec. <laughs> It's experiment time with our resident experiment expert, charter clinical psychologist, Dr. Cecilia De Felici. How are you doing? I'm great, thank you. So tell me, this week's experiment, what was it about? What do we want to find out? Well, we want to find out what the new housemates really think of the old housemates and vice versa. We know that the new housemates have been watching the old housemates, don't we? Yes, so yes, really obviously. Want, obviously, so we're really trying to get inside their minds. So what we've asked them to do is role-play each other. Recent research suggests that if you give people extra mental loading, extra things to do, they're much less likely to lie convincingly. So we've asked them to role-play in the hope that we're going to see a little bit more than the nicey nicey stuff that we've been seeing. Okay, so we've chosen a few key housemates to look at. That's right. And the first we've chosen is Amy. Amy. So let's have a look. 
Hello, Amanda. Hello. Amanda, who are you closest to in the house? Um, well, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm closest to Sam because she's like my twin, duh. But um, no, like, I just, I get on really well with everyone. Like, I love everybody. Everything's so cool. We just have so much fun together, the whole group. Amanda, what do you like about Amy? Um, well, she's got, like, loads of clothes and stuff so we can all, like, try on. And her shoes are the same size as us so we can share and stuff, which is really cool. And, like, we can all just be girly and, like, do each other's hair together and stuff. Amanda, what do you dislike about Amy? Um, well, I don't really know. I mean, I don't think I dislike anything. Like, we just have fun all the time. Amanda, is there anything else you would like to speak to Big Brother about? Um, no, I don't think so. But, like, oh, although we've got to use those toilet rolls with our faces on and, like, Amy and Jonty haven't got any, so, like, what are we going to do? <laughs> Do you know, first off, I need to point out that this in this experiment, they chose who they wanted yeah, to play. That's right. So Amanda's quite an interesting choice mm. for Amy, mm. isn't she? Well, she is, isn't she? Because she is a real rival, you know, yeah. for Liam's affections. So it's very interesting that she has chosen um, Amanda. And it looks, on the surface, quite positive. You know, it looks almost as though she's rehearsed it, like she's well, practiced it. Well, I felt like it. she'd... It looked to me like she'd been doing it on the outside with her friends, like Amanda was the best impression she did of the people yeah. in the house. Yeah, and, and I think you're spot on. It does feel very rehearsed. But there's something about it that is a little bit mocking. It's a little mm. bit condescending. It's like she dumbs her down. Mm. And I think well, this... Her yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's not that kind. And I think that she's, you know, what's going on here is something that the other women in the house have felt about her, is that she rather looks down on the other girls. She's not a girly girl. She's not a girly girl, she wants the boys for herself, mm. and there's a lot of rivalry in all of this. Now, there's a very interesting projective identification when she says that the twins would really like to wear all of her clothes and all of her shoes. Well, that's when you sort of want to have something of the other person, so you project into them and then take that thing into yourself. Mm -hmm. So by saying that the twins would want to have her clothes and her shoes and her stuff, she's really talking about wanting to be like the twins and, and you know, having all of that sort of revered status the twins have. The twins are adored by everybody in the house. And I think Amy would really like to be adored in that way herself. And they have a kind of innocence that's sort of untouchable, don't they? I Which mean, is not like yeah, Amy, is it? No, well, she's been revealing stuff about herself. Self I keep looking, I keep looking, Amy, right. don't say it. And she says something really interesting at the end, which is about the lavatory paper. Now, yes, what's because they say, about? does Amanda want to say anything else to Big Brother? She could have just stopped at no. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. She? Then she's like, Lou Roll. Yeah, she wants Lou Roll. Now, this is really interesting, because first of all, it's telling us that she wants mm. to have the same status as the other members of the house. Yes. So her ego is demanding that she gets treated exactly the same as everybody else. She doesn't want there to be any separation for her. She wants to be seen as exactly the same as the other housemates and have everything that they have. But also, it's like Lou paper. It's just like she's flying. Flashing Amanda down the loo because the association is right after she's been That's Amanda. Nice. So it kind of again nice. feels like it's, it's not nice, a bit diminishing. Okay, yes. Amy also chose to impersonate Liam. Yeah. Hello, Liam. All right. Liam, do you have any regrets about the way you've behaved in the house? No, not at all. I just come in here and been myself and had a laugh and stuff, so. No. Liam, what do you like about Amy? She's just canny lass, like, a bit bonny, and we just chat well and stuff, so good crack on that, you know. Liam, what do you dislike about Amy? Oh, she can be really hard work sometimes, you know. Just like, um... I don't know, she just looks as funny and stuff, so... Just a bit weird, thinks about things too much, maybe, but, um... But no, can he most of the time? Actually, I have to say that made me feel a little bit sorry for her because I suddenly thought she's so feeling distant from him. Mm. It's very much about her conflict and her vulnerability, I think, mm. here. You know, she's tapping away at the chair. This yeah, tells constant, us there's a it? lot so... of tension, there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of irritation, possibly with herself, about the way things are going. And what we've got here is a girl who has thrown herself at Liam. She really wanted him. She made that really explicit right from the start. And when she got him in the halfway house, she must have been ecstatic. Mm. But when they go into the main house together, 
together. He's not saying, come on in as my girlfriend. He's saying, sorry, love, you've got to stay in the background a little bit. I thought bit. initially that might be a nice thing that he was doing, but now he hasn't got back with her. I'm realising it's just a sort of brush-off. I think Liam needs to see what other people think about Amy before he would come out with something going on between them. And I think we're going to see more evidence over the next week that he is trying to distance himself from her. We know what he did with Nikki. He got very close to Nikki straight off, didn't he? But when he saw that she was perceived as being a bad person in the house, he backed yeah. right off. And so he needs to have validation from the others before he'd come out with that. She's feeling really distressed here. When she's saying she about the... She needs to find a mate. Well, if, without his protection, mm. I think she could be up for eviction. I really do, do, because the other women are very anti her already, and she's feeling quite paranoid about her position in the house. Wow. Well, yeah. Um, she needs to make friends with the girls. I keep saying that. Yeah, make um, friends with the girls. Okay, finally, let's look at Brian. Yes, yeah, let's look at Brian. Hello, Amy. Yo, big brother. Yeah, hello. My name's Amy. I'm a glamour model. Did, did I not tell you I'm a glamour model? Amy, who are you closest to in the house? To be honest with you, like, I don't really care about everyone else in the house. I just really, like, care about me and looking in the mirror. And, like... But I suppose if I was closest to anyone, it would be the boys, because they're easiest to wrap around my little my finger, really. Amy, what do you dislike about Brian? Keeps talking to my tits. Like, I know the great, big, humongous, deluptious tits, but why do you have to keep talking to them? I have a face. It's here. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, he's brilliant. <laughs> but, you know, for me... That's so insightful because already he's tagged on to the fact that she's a man's woman mm, mm. and that she's wrapping them all around her, yes. her fingers yeah. and he knows that he's admitting that, isn't he? Yes. Brian is amazing. He's like the emotional barometer of the house and if Brian is thinking this about Amy then you can bet your bottom dollar that other people are as well. Yeah. He's very accurate, he's spot on, he's spotted in Amy that her, she's very vulnerable, it all has to be about her because this is a defence you know, yes, for her vulnerability. In the looking in the mirror, having, you know, being great, pointing to all her assets and also that he can't take her, his eyes off these assets as well and he's very self-aware that he's easily manipulated too but I think what he's saying here is they're not sure that they can trust her. Mm. You know, he's saying that she's very egotistical. It's all about her. Somewhere hanging in their minds is going to be the idea that she betrayed all the other halfway yes. housemates. And if she did ruthlessly, it to them, could she do it? To yeah. Them? Can they trust her? The and originals. I think he's saying here doesn't think he can trust her. And I think he's also saying, back off. Liam's ours. He's our friend. He's not your friend yet. And if they're thinking, you know, if we're seeing that on the outside, thinking, hang on a bit, do we really want to see Amy with Liam? I'm not sure that we do. Imagine how intense that feeling must be in the house. They're going to be very protective about Liam, and I'm not sure that Amy is going to come off well in all of this. I feel a little bit sorry for Amy. She might have shot her bolt. I feel a bit, I feel a bit sorry mm, for her. I she do. might have, yeah, peaked too soon. OK, thank you very much. Cecilia! <laughs> Next up, how the three new housemates will change the Big Brother house forever. This series. See you in a bit. Welcome back to Big Brother on the Couch. Now, last Friday, five halfway housemates entered the halfway house, and on Monday, two of them became housemates, and one housemate became a halfway. On Tuesday, another halfway housemate became a housemate, and then swapped with an original housemate. And on Wednesday, four more swapped, and on Friday, two of them were evicted. Well, if you think that's confusing, imagine what it must have been like to be one of them. I f don't feel like a housemate anymore. <laughs> I made a stay for a little while. I'm going to ask for Liam to come into the halfway house. What? She thought that one or two people might come over from that side and then that would be it. You are no longer Big Brother housemates. There's <laughs> too Anyone? much in the panel. I wish there were four really horrible people and then we could have said, oh, well, this is easy, it's A, B, C, yeah. D. I don't know how she can say that. <laughs> I'm back. Miss you, miss you. The house has become a lot, lot lonelier place. I'm going. <laughs> didn't appreciate this place. I'm very curious to see what happens next. Aren't we all? Aren't we all? 
Oh, anyway, joining me now to discuss the psychological effects of all those comings and goings are chartered psychologist Dr. Jella Richards and columnist for The Independent, Johan Hari. Hi, guys. Hi. How are you? Hi. Okay, so let's kick off with you, Jella. Um, what's the psychological impact of, of all these new housemates going in so late in the game? I mean, we've only got four or five weeks to go. But it's quite disruptive for the present housemates, the kind of established housemates, because it really affects their cohesiveness, it disrupts it. Also, the kind of e equilibrium, the balance, is kind of it's unbalanced now, basically. And that really introduces a feeling of um, uncertainty. Disease but, as well. Yes, isn't it? exactly. It's like... So it's like it, uncomfortable. Yeah, makes, doesn't make them feel very stable, kind of affects their stability as well. So they um, become alert, hyper alert, they become more vigilant, they go more into survival mode and guessing mode, anticipating, because they're not sure what to expect. Yeah, and how they, the others are playing it. Are they playing games? And also they think that the others have got inside information, don't they? Yeah. So they're going to be a bit more paranoid about Definitely. that. Definitely. And... Definitely. And are they using it? I mean, Carol's been amazing, hasn't she? Carol is slowly morphing into Miss Marple. Have you noticed that? <laughs> yes! She, she figures out everything. It's amazing. Yes. She needs her own little theme tune, doesn't exactly. she? Exactly. She's sort of like, you know... How did it go? I know oh, yeah. that's the murder she wrote, isn't it? Sorry. <laughs> well, anyway. Love that one as well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, Johan, you know, we saw um, Ziggy heroically yeah. um, falling on his sword wow. and <laughs> going into the halfway house. But, you know, he'd become quite unpopular with the public because of the way he treated Chanel. Is this going to sway the public's opinion? We know that Ziggy is by far the, co the housemate is most conscious for how he's being viewed in the outside world. He talks yeah. about it a lot of the time. Yeah. He hypothesises about it all the time, oh, this will be viewed that way, this will be viewed the other way. Actually, interestingly, he, he often that takes the form of worrying what his parents will think about how he's behaving. Yeah, he really... Which is an interesting kind of projection. So, no, we, I think this is, this is quite bogus, actually. Basically, he realised he was going to be unpopular with the public because he treated Chanel really quite badly. But he has, he's very good at turning events to his advantage. He always has the same thing where, after he does something horrible, he goes into the diary room wearing his hoodie top with Lane, his... Yeah, Lane, open, over. Looking very upset, looking very disturbed. He says, you know, big brother, I'm really trying. He's and manipulating us. Exactly, he is. And I think what's really interesting, one of the reasons why Ziggy is so divisive with the public is because half of us just look at that and go, you know, give me a break. And this is so look, transparent. Oh, look, there's a nice bit of chest underneath <laughs> that top. And, 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 but half, half the public... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's true, but true. half the public at the very least think, oh, that's quite convincing. Fair enough, he's agonised, he's thinking about it, you know. But do you think he's really totally fake? Because I do think there's a good person in Ziggy. Oh, I, th I think he was so Somewhere. foul to Chanel. He was yeah, horrible. Yeah, he was foul. He was Particularly, foul, he knew I don't that think Chanel he felt had, good about it. He knew that Chanel had had a really difficult life. He still treated her really badly. You know, he had sex with her on television and then... And it's different... No, but did they? Well, he may have had sex with her on television. Anyway, moving swiftly <laughs> on. Um, Jella... Um, I'm going to change the subject completely. Thank I just you. want to talk about Liam, um, because, you know, when he went into the house, uh, you know, he had that chat with Ziggy, and then he went and snogged Amy on the floor. We all know he's completely kind of gagging for it. And, and then sort of distanced himself. Now, was that a good move? That's really? not really changing the subject, though, is it? Because we're well, still, it's not on, a, the still on the subject. love thing. Yes, yeah, I'm yeah. calling it love. <laughs> Lust, love. Yeah. Well, I think um, if you look at it in short term, it, as you said, I mean, he was feeling quite sexually frustrated. And so he found a way to have a cuddle with Amy to help him release that. So biologically, it kind of helped him release some kind of tension. And also psychologically, it, you know, validated his kind of self-esteem and confirmed that, you know, that he was an attractive um, bloke. But so it might have made him feel better, but what about other people's opinion of him? I mean, they don't know in there, but we know. Yeah, and I, I, I think that's really true. And we, we see that when he decides to say, let's cool it, because really what's happened is that he is thinking about how he's perceived. It affects his um, cognitive dissonance because he holds, really, two conflicting beliefs about himself. And he has to find a way, really, to resolve them. He has this belief about uh, himself, Liam, being a really nice type of guy and everything. And that's a kind of positive aspect. Then he's got that negative one about, well, I just kind of, like, you know, went with somebody that, you know, for one particular reason, I didn't really enjoy yeah, which isn't the Liam we've come to know and love. Well, that's why he's out of character. Well, that's why he has to find a way to actually resolve it. And the way that yeah. he tries to resolve that kind of, that conflict, that kind of inner turmoil, if you want to call it, is he actually just says, I think we should cool it. That's his kind of way of doing it. Yeah. I think that's double-edged for Liam, because on the one hand, particularly female viewers, remember men who've done that to them, and it's like, oh, that, that's not so very yes. nice. Yes, yes, that's but true. on the other hand, he's got to distance himself from Amy. Amy is the closest thing you can get to a dead housemate walking, you know. That, that, <laughs> that, um, that nomination process was uh, an act of suicide for her. Yes. You know? She did all the things we know in Big Brother yes. people hate. 
coldness, contempt. You should just wave the other housemates aside, you know, oh, they've got nothing to contribute. You know, these people she'd gone in with, she should have had a bonding experience with, so she looked cold and treacherous, just disaster. So, she's in a way, kind of Big Brother it. suicide, is that what you're exactly. saying? Well, let's exactly. have a look. Yeah. Let's have a look at Amy committing hurry, Kiri. <laughs> My first choice is going to be David. Oh, the, gotcha. Yeah, there's a little bit of an overconfident sort of. Also, I'm definitely. So, if I had my way, I'd, I'd have the new people out. Yeah. They've got nothing that says they they should stay in there. That singles out one of your lot. One, one person. Pick a strong one. Who? Tracy's a strong. She survived second. three evictions. Yeah. Come on, come on. All agreed. Come. On. Well, you know. No. Can see with that. Can I? Can I just say just something? Just say actually? something. Joanne. <laughs> I want to hear what you've got to say. Well, I think, unfortunately, what um, the mistake that Amy made was that she didn't show any kind of empathy at all. No. Liam and Diggy, they, they can kind of get away with it because they weren't actually considered to be part of the halfway housemates. Yeah. And she is. She's supposed to be part of a team, you know. And then when she kind of explains her decision, it's really about how she, you know about what was going on for her. Well, it was Jonty, to be honest. Jonty was the person. Jonty was the first exactly, one who kicked out exactly, with David, wasn't it? He was the first one, but Jonty yeah. kind of said about how, you know, he kind of showed empathy. He thought, you, you know, about how it was probably be quite yes. difficult for the housemates, the um, halfway housemates, and that he kind of, like, understood them, whereas Amy's more about how it was for her. And I think, again, they thought, well, you don't seem like you're part of us, and you just seem like you're only thinking about yourself. And, OK, Jonty had to make that decision. But also, I must say, actually, I don't think Jonty is seen as kind of maybe as much a kind of a credible rivalry for, you know, to stay in the house. I don't think he's taken no, it seriously. No, I think because of his teddies and everything. Yeah. People are thinking, well, he's not a worry yeah, at all. But yeah. Amy, on the other hand, well, yeah. Liam, might be popular. I think it's true. Liam and Ziggy found a positive reason to know that. He said, Tracy's tough. She'll survive. We know she'll get through it. Amy, just so annihilating. There's nothing to keep them in. You know, that's really damning. But what's interesting about Amy as well is she's in an unusual position for a housemate who goes in late because we know that she's been able to watch all of it. Usually they're kind of hidden away. Yeah. But these ones haven't been. And we know she's swatted up on it all. You know, she yeah. went and talked to, to Ziggy about dogs, to Liam about bikes straight away. What's interesting, though, she's swatted up on the details, but she's totally missed the bigger picture. You know, right. she may have, you know she's missed... What, what do you not do in Big Brother? Don't look cult. If you're yeah. in a situation like yeah. that, you should do what Ashleen did in the last series, yeah. weep and howl right. and say... I don't want to oh, make this, yeah, Big Brother, exactly. this is awful. You know, basically have a nervous breakdown and look really guilty. Her apology has just made it even worse, because whereas John T apologised by saying, it must have been really hard for you, actually, and empathise with them, as, he was, as Jella was saying, she just went up and said, you know, you don't know how tough it was for me. Well, that's not, not going to work. No, no that's, that's not going to work. Again, it's not shown that she can actually see another person's point of view. That exactly. She's just thinking exactly of herself. She's totally alienated herself, and she realises it later, doesn't she? And mm. as Cecilia said, she doesn't think she's going to be long for that house. She's, she's yeah. going to be nominated this week. She's right about one week. thing, at least, then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What does that mean? She's, she's not going to be long for the house. Oh, oh I no, I don't mean Cecilia's right. Yeah, about I was it. thinking. Cecilia well, is. Cecilia, in, in my book, no. she's right about everything. Cecilia is invariably right on all things. No, no, I mean, Amy and is right about one thing. Now, Johan, mm. Amy, John, T and Carl Louise, they're fully fledged housemates. Now, we know from past uh, series that coming in at a late stage, very, very hard to get accepted. What can they do? Will they ever be accepted? Well, it's interesting. How should they play it? It's a credit to the former housemates. They've been accepted as much as they have. It's partly because Cara Louise and John T are very amiable, they're very keen to please. But basically, I think with the viewing public, it's almost impossible. I mean, you know better than anyone else. They get almost immediately voted out, new housemates. It takes such a long time for us to build affection for a Big Brother housemate, you know. I think even... Did you someone... notice the cheer on yeah. Friday night that Tracy yeah. got, even though I know that with, yes. the, with the public, they quite like her, but she's... She's never had a cheer like that before, but it's because she's a fully-fledged housemate. And they feel familiarity with yeah. her. And we, when we feel familiarity with people, we feel that we know them, we yeah. feel that we can relate to them. And even though Tracy may, may be seen maybe as having some kind of unusual and unique and idiosyncratic kind of characteristics, we've become to understand them, or we yeah. think we understand them. So you think you can kind of explain... And she's more predictable. We also want people who are predictable. Mm. You can say something about them, and you can't really, with these two at the moment. They have come in really, really late in the day, I and, think. And also, I think if Tracy had gone in this late at the same time as the halfway housemate, she wouldn't be getting cheers yeah. like that. It, it's because, as you say, it's the accumulation of familiarity and we start to like the person. So, who do you think will be up for nomination? I know there's going to be a resounding Amy But I there. think... Yeah. <laughs> Unless everyone else is struck by lightning, Amy's Amy, being nominated. And I think also yeah. probably um, Carol as well. I think, yes. you know, because Carol... We've seen different types of But she's so powers. indispensable in that house. She's been clever. She, they, they feel... You know, she's mother... I, I think she's nominated. also devised... I think she's also provided a kind of divisive... Um, um, 
kind of characteristic as well because she's got her boys, you know, she's... Um, but yes. she also... Some people are a bit upset, I think, that the way she kind of came in there and, and kind of not engineered but was involved in knowing about the process of Liam and um, Chanel going and things like that. Mm. And, you know, again, there are certain things like some aspects like to have fun. She doesn't symbolise fun. She symbolises kind of routine and being very, very serious and, and getting things done and so pragmatic. You think, you think she might get nominated for that? Yeah. What about you? Yeah, I th I'm afraid, I think, at the moment, they're not going to want to nominate anyone. Do you, th they do you not think like they'll nominate everyone. another new housemate? It's difficult. I think Cara Louise may well get nominated. She's quite bland, she's not got that much to give, although I don't think the men will nominate her because they're desperate for any kind of new stimulation, I think. But she's know. quite light-hearted, though, isn't she? she you might don't, be quite neither of you think John T? No, John T's nice. Not at they this like stage. Him. Not at this stage. I think maybe Jerry later. Jerry loves him because it's yeah. brain food. Exactly. Well, Jerry, Jerry, I think his brain is going to burst very soon yeah. in rage, and I think other parts of him might burst quite soon. Now <laughs> David's gone as well, yeah. so. Yeah. <laughs> you guys, I better wrap it up there. Thanks so much, <laughs> Jella and Johan. <laughs> That's it for tonight. Join me same time next week for more brain analysis. But next, it's Big Brother. Good night. And that's followed by Johnny Depp in our scary Sunday movie, From Hell, at 10 o'clock. <laughs>